aren't many movies with a more iconic ending than David Fincher's Fight Club. You met me at a very strange time in my life. We spend most of the film following the unnamed narrator and his new friend, Tyler Durden, as they hit it off and form a fight club. The first rule of Fight Club is, you do not talk about Fight Club. The numb, deadpan narrator. I am Jack's raging bile duct and freewheeling, risk-taking Tyler are total opposites, apart from their shared penchant for getting beaten to a pulp. I want you to hit me as hard as you can. So first-time viewers get a shock to learn that the two are actually the same person. Because we're the same person. That's right. Before we go on, we want to tell you a little bit about this video's sponsor. Mubi is a curated film streaming service with a twist. You get 30 films per month, a new film every day. And these films are a hand-picked selection of influential movie gems from around the globe. We're huge fans of Mubi at Screen Prism. So go ahead and click the link in our description below to get a full month of Mubi for free. The narrator is an unfulfilled everyman and a cog in the corporate machine. This is your life, and it's ending one minute at a time. He flies endlessly for his job, and his only joy in life is buying IKEA furniture for his condo. So to find a way out of his misery, the narrator invents Tyler, the ideal man the narrator wishes he could be. Tyler is unpredictable, sexy, and embodies living in the moment. All the ways you wish you could be, that's me. I look like you want to look, I like you want to. I am smart, capable, and most importantly, I'm free in all the ways that you are not. The irony, of course, is that he already is Tyler, so he has the potential in him to be everything he wants to be. But he had to externalize these parts of himself as an imaginary other person in order to let himself live as Tyler. The film hints all the way through that Tyler and the narrator are one and the same. I know this because Tyler knows this. Sometimes Tyler spoke for me. I fell down some stairs. I fell down some stairs. And there are other uncanny similarities between them. We have the exact same briefcase. In one scene, Tyler is driving the car and crashes it, but then we see him crawl out of the passenger side, while the narrator has to be dragged out from the driver's seat. We find out that Tyler blew up the narrator's condo, and the narrator's denial is so strong that he's deeply angry at his alter ego. That was not just a bunch of stuff that got destroyed. It was me. But deep down, the narrator obviously wanted to break free and stop defining himself by his possessions. The things you own end up owning you. He was just so paralyzed and repressed that his mind had to create an imaginary frenemy in order to express his true desires. The fact that the narrator doesn't even have a name is a pretty big clue that he's meant to represent all of us and all of society. We get intoxicated by Tyler throughout Fight Club because, like the narrator, we're socialized. Much of the time, we don't let ourselves do what we really want to. The big twist makes us look back at the events of the film with different eyes. All of the times we saw them together and thought the narrator was going along with Tyler's outrageous behavior, it was really the narrator behaving this way, using the invented personality of Tyler to give him the daring to act out on his repressed impulses for danger and aggression and we start to revisit our feelings about Tyler. For most of the story, we found his nonconformist, devil-may-care outlook exciting, liberating, even inspiring. I say never be complete. I say stop being perfect. I say let, let's evolve. But the character we've been seduced by is the mental projection of a psychologically disturbed person. There's a dark side to Tyler's charisma. He manipulates people into serving his cause with an intensity that feels like brainwashing. His name is Robert Paulson. His name is Shut Robert up. Paulson. This is all over with. And he does not like it when anyone defects. He's very good at pointing out the problems with society. Almost two decades later, his critiques of consumerism feel pretty spot on. Advertising has us chasing cars and clothes, working jobs we hate so we can buy shit we don't need. But Tyler's solutions to these problems are a little terrifying. In the world I see, you're stalking out through the damn canyon forest around the ruins of Rockefeller Center. Is it really necessary to go back to being hunter-gatherers? It's only after we've lost everything that we're free to do anything. 
Tyler Durden is basically the id in all of us. That instinctual drive to do what we feel, to destroy and create, and to be totally honest and authentic. Is that your blood? Some of it, yeah. A little bit of being like Tyler Durden feels fantastic, but letting Tyler take over and run the show is catastrophic. The narrator gives over too much of his agency to this impulsive darkness within him. You're making a big mistake, fellas. You said you'd say that. I'm not Tyler Durden! You told us you'd say that, too. The clues also indicate that the narrator is the one developing a relationship with Marla. You won't believe this dream I had last night. Yeah, I can hardly believe anything you had last night. When we first see a sex scene with Marla, we assume it's with the narrator even though he thinks she's sleeping with Tyler. Except for their humping, Tyler and Marla were never in the same room. This statement implies that psychologically, he feels he's Tyler when he's sexual with Marla, but he's himself at all other moments with her, which we can imagine has been a really fun and not at all confusing experience for Marla. You're an insane person. One potential reading of Fight Club is that all of this has really been about a girl. Meeting Marla sends the narrator into a state of disturbed confusion. If I did have a tumor, I'd name it Marla. And that's what actually sparks his creating Tyler, to avoid dealing with his feelings about her. You big tourist, I need this, now get out! He feels that he needs to be Tyler to start a sexual relationship with her. You wanna finish her off? Marla has put up with an awful lot in this relationship. You are such a nutcase, I can't even begin to keep up. So by sharing this final moment with her, the narrator is showing he's open to connecting with another person as himself, not Tyler. We feel optimistic seeing Marla and the narrator take solace in each other. They have the chance to start a real relationship and to build a better future on the ruins of the old society. When we first meet Tyler, he explains that the oxygen masks on planes are really meant to sedate people. Oxygen gets you high. In a catastrophic emergency, you're taking giant panic breaths. Suddenly you become euphoric, docile. You accept your fate. Blank faces, calm as Hindu cows. In his view, we are all the people getting high on the oxygen masks to avoid our reality. We're so numb thanks to our capitalist comforts that we don't see we're pretty much dead already. So Tyler reverses this picture. He makes people think they're going to die so they feel alive. Tomorrow will be the most beautiful day of Raymond Chaos's life. While he's driving, Tyler lets go of the wheel and lets the car crash, just to give the narrator a teachable moment. We just had a near-life experience. So the fundamental seed of Tyler's worldview is that First you have to know, not fear, know that someday you're gonna die. Ultimately, Tyler's attraction to death is really the narrator's, and we see this morbidity early in the film. The narrator tries to feel close to death through attending support groups for people with serious illnesses. When people think you're dying, man, they really, really listen to you instead of just... Instead of just waiting for their turn to speak. Marla, with her all-black clothes and a cigarette always in her mouth, is the image of a death wish. Marla's philosophy of life was that she might die at any moment. The tragedy, she said, was that she didn't. When she asks the narrator to come over and feel her breast for signs of cancer, she's let down when he doesn't find a lump. You feel nothing. No, nothing. Both characters feel that if they actually were dying, then maybe their lives would mean more. But the narrator can only get so much release out of pretending to be close to death. And so Fight Club is born so that he can feel real physical pain with an actual risk of death. Fight Club starts as a male bonding fantasy. The film emphasizes how important it is for men to connect with other men. It's for men only. And let out their aggressive impulses. Sorry. These men feel the need to fight to express their larger cultural dissatisfaction. I felt sorry for guys packed into gyms, trying to look like how Calvin Klein or Tommy Hilfiger said they should. The fact that all of this comes out of a fascination with death tells us there's something deeply wrong with the regular life these people lead. The men need Fight Club for the same reason the narrator needs Tyler. Their society doesn't allow them to be balanced, fulfilled human beings. We're the middle children of history, man. No purpose or place. We have no great war, no great depression. Our great war is a spiritual war. Our great depression is our lives. 
Fight Club makes men feel something by reminding them of their bodies. Pain is feeling, and feeling is living. It really hurts. Right. Again. Fight scenes so blur the line between pain and pleasure, they almost look erotic. Oh, yeah! Tyler gets off on pain. For him, living in the moment doesn't just mean riding the highs, but also being present for bad experiences. Stay with the pain, don't shut this out. No, no, no. Tyler doesn't want to just go on getting beaten up and feeling alive, though. His plan is to organize the fighters into an army, so they can violently impose their anarchist principles and bring down society. He believes the cure to capitalist depression is to blow up the credit card companies. You erase the debt record, then we all go back to zero. But Fight Club doesn't really help the men build something better. It just gives them another escape. When the fight was over, nothing was solved, but nothing mattered. And by the end, the narrator has to decide if he really wants to destroy everything or if there should be a limit to this anarchy. The ending of Fight Club forces us to consider what would really happen if we blew everything up and started a new civilization. What would that new society look like? When you look down, you'll see tiny figures pounding corn, laying strips of venison in the empty carpool lane of some abandoned superhighway. So the answer the film is giving us isn't to buy into capitalist life and become slaves to the system, but it's also not to unleash total chaos and violence on the world. Finally, the narrator kills his mental projection by shooting himself in the mouth. Why do you want to put a gun to your head? Not my head, Tyler. Our head. Once he kills Tyler, he absorbs those impulses back into himself, and he becomes a more balanced person. His reason and logic are back in control of his instincts. But all of this began because initially his instincts weren't awakened at all. They were too oppressed by his rational and conscientious mind and this created a backlash. The film tells us to confront death and darkness head on, not just numb ourselves. Fight Club suggests we should find a balance between structure and rebellion, between boundaries and self-expression, between having stuff and finding freedom. As the explosives detonate, the narrator takes the hand of his sort of girlfriend Marla, watches the buildings fall, and for the first time, seems to be at peace. Hi guys, this is Susanna. I'm really happy to be talking about Mubi today because I've actually been a subscriber for years. I love this streaming service. Mubi is a treasure trove of films that you won't discover anywhere else. They curate exceptional movies from around the globe, and every day a new film is added and the oldest is taken away. So in this world where it's very easy to spend hours debating what you should watch and feel overwhelmed by all the choice, Mubi is like having a really cool friend with amazing taste in movies, making it so much easier for you. They feature hard to come by masterpieces, indie festival darlings, influential art house and foreign films, lesser known films by your favorite famous directors, and more. Plus, you can even download the films to watch offline, and there are no ads ever. One film you can watch right now on Mubi is Light Sleeper, about a drug dealer trying to change his ways. It's written and directed by Paul Schrader, whose latest movie, First Reformed, is now out in theaters and getting rave reviews. Point is, I can't recommend it highly enough. You can try Movie Out right now for free for a whole month. Just click the link in the description below.